set up a first snapshot, more or less post pandemic, you could say, but what ridership is doing. And I just have it aggregated for the first quarter so you could have a um, accurate comparison. But in uh, FY17, uh, we had about 2.9 million um, similar in FY19, which was that first year of the network redesign when Micro expanded in Pulse. We had 2.9. We were going to have an amazing year in uh, FY20 where we were exceeding all of that, but we know that last quarter uh, we saw a significant drop. Well, if you look at FY23, um, we have trended, we are actually trending above what we were in FY19. Um, so you can quickly look at those zero fares and you just assume that their trends were the same across the quarters. I mean, that gets you at like 12 million. Is that 2013? I mean, 2023 number estimated based on the first months, or is that? That's accurate ridership data. That's accurate right Yeah, this is all reported information. Right. Um, so they are going to get into projections that they did, and theirs were very conservative. But I just wanted to show what was actually happening out there because it was not theirs is not based on actual ridership. So if these trends did continue, we are looking at hitting. I mean, something could happen seasonally, but around twelve million riders. Okay. With that, I am going to hand this over to well, one more. So we covered the first two. What they're going to cover is the one that we're not as familiar with. Um, which is the fair cap with the account based system. Steering or Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, hi, this is uh, Derek Long with Michael Baker International. Um, joining me on the call is uh, Nick Britton and Rick Williams. And so we'd like to present a couple of slides um, from our work. Um, with GRTC and with our subconsultant um, uh, for Foursquare um, on this. And so in, in looking at the, the three different um, scenarios for, for fares that the, uh, the account base uh, scenario is a, you know, a fairly new um, method of implementing fares. And so just in, in brief, I mean, perhaps uh, Adrian could have a better explanation overall about the program itself, but um, this is just another way to um, you know generate revenues through fares but to also account for equity considerations for the the, the types of riders on the grtc system and so um, there are both you know pros and cons um, with the account base uh, fare capping uh, program as opposed to regular um, fares and just the example shown here is just you know with regular fares a passenger um, would need to have upfront cash to pay for a pass for a certain number of rides per you know per month, but with the uh, the fare capping and so forth, that they would ultimately get a, a discount for for more rides. Just the way the program works that GRTC is looking at. So you'll see in our revenue forecast that the revenues do de decline some from this program, but again, it's intended more to. Um, provide equity uh, across the line, uh, across the, the, the types of different uh, markets and ridership that GRTC provides. Uh, go to the next slide. So we'll just share a couple of things about our, our forecast and how we went about reviewing each of the three scenarios. Um, in, in doing any kind of ridership uh, forecast, as you know, that it's, it's very challenging, difficult, just given the state of, of COVID where everything has, has gone the last several years and so um, our team had to make a series of, of different assumptions um, whether they're right or wrong or somewhere in between um, you know, naturally that's just how um, you know, forecasts are done you make certain assumptions um, really a, a big part of um, the ridership assumptions generating the ridership figures for the 10-year period through 2032 um, was to look at the, the, the historic ridership per hour of GRTC so within the last you know five six years and basically use that ridership per hour as a basis to conduct um, the, the forecasting method. And so we applied that to each of the, of the different um, scenarios um, and then you know, figured out what the, the, the fair revenues could be based on, on those uh, ridership assumptions. So the next slide. So here's um, the, some outputs um, in, in five-year increments in the future. Um, I'm thinking, looking at back at some of our Past information. I think that the regular fares ridership should be about 9.2 million, not the 7.9, but um, in any case, you could see that they're all relatively consistent across the board. 
Um, there are some, you know, deviations. Um, when, when you, you know, when you consider regular fare scenarios for ridership is about 9.2 million in 2027 and 2032, that they're comparable with the other um, scenarios of continuing zero fares and with the new fare count, cap, um, capping account based uh, fares. And so, um, really at this point with the ridership um, projections that they are all you know, they're pretty you know, similar um, across the across the board there. Uh, yeah, next slide. I would add some more to this. Right there. Yeah, oh, I didn't mention so what they did is they actually took our fiscal year 16 number because that was what they saw as a highest number at that time. And then they um, put some sensitivities to service. So that's within per hour. So if that's why you'll see some fluctuations down, they assumed at some point, just like our trying to show that we would have some service happen. Again, this is very conservative, but I showed you in the beginning, um, as far as what we would assume for the zero fares, I would assume the same for our regular base fare, only because we do have historical data and not base fares that I'm not familiar with since we haven't done that. Okay, so I think the move on to the next slide. Um, let's see. So um, let's see. So the the fair revenue per projections um, here. Let's see. Make sure this is the right revenue projections. Okay, on ridership. That um, you know, with the with the continuation of the zero fares, of course, naturally over a ten year period, there wouldn't be any collection of it. Um, with regular fares and account-based fares, which is the fare capping, you can see that difference there. Um, as I mentioned, the regular fares and the ridership projections would, uh, you know, basically assume that the 2019 fare structure and, um, you know, and, and how that's built. Whereas the, the fare capping, as I mentioned, that um, you know, several different markets, whether they uh, may be, you know, seniors or, or or disabled residents or others. They would be eligible for um, again the, the fair capping structure, so that um, essentially they would pay less for more rides overall. So that's what the result you would see that given the similar ridership um, forecast for regular fares and fair capping account based, that you would get lower revenues. So ultimately, you know that leaves somewhat of a delta or a gap in the fair revenues that are collected under each structure. Um, and certainly what we're presenting in terms of the fair revenues alone is just one um, aspect to consider when you're thinking about each of these um, you know, fair scenarios. Um, you know, because we, we have gone through some interviews um, you know, with the operators and, and got, got their perspective about these programs. And certainly GRTC and Adrian could, could share some of those um, you know, outcomes with you there. Uh, some additional assumptions um, that we, um, you know, worked with GRTC on included uh, loss of VCU funding in 2024, and perhaps Adrian could you know, speak more about that. Um, our ARPA funding, which is the American Rescue Plan funding, um, GRTC, as you may know, um, was eligible to receive um, a bit of federal um, stimulus type type money. So ARPA is is one of them. And so uh, there's the, the timing of when those funds will come into play to help uh, perhaps fill, fill some potential gaps in the revenues. The, the current TRIP grant that DRTP um, administers, um, that enables the zero fare program to, uh, to continue today, but there's a continued need to have that uh, so-called local match um, to, to keep that program going. So that's embedded in the assumptions um, there's additional supplemental funding that is needed to um, to, to go past um, when the, the trip grant ends. And so there's an assumption that there's 5.5 5 million in the zero based um, fare uh, so scenario to keep that um, program going, but it needs that additional money listed here. And then also there are some, uh, some assumptions for um, inflation. In, in some of the operating costs and other revenues that you presume would grow over time over the next 10 years? Basically, we didn't want to assume that there was revenue sources that we have not already um, identified. Um, so we're assuming that we have not necessarily negotiated the partnership with DCU. So we're not going to assume we have that. Uh, we have not 
determined if we're moving forward. So therefore, we are not sure of the match for the trip program. So that is not just consumed in the calculations. Um, and then as far as the 5.5 million, that's the gap moving on, of course, the trip program being 7.4 minus the amount that we are determining to be the offset from the administrative amount. Um, and then like the percent percent increases just based on uh, inflation. Another thing as far as assumptions that I forgot to mention in the beginning, we're assuming just with this, just so it can be comparative, service neutral. So we are not assuming the expansion. So as you see the numbers later, I mean, looking at CBT, it's just listed in there as far as the revenue source um, and some other ones, uh, knowing that we have earmarked those already. Uh, so it, and there will be other, other growth also, but this is just a comparison process. Thank you. So this slide, you know, we're throwing some some numbers at you here, but um, essentially for each of the three fair scenarios, we um, added up the total revenues for GRTC operating for um, these five year um, uh, five year periods. Although we do have annual numbers available, um, so we summed up the different um, revenues and and costs. And that the screen went blank. Is that the case, Adrian? It did. My computer died. Oh, okay. This is um, Michael Baker International Force Service Consultant. Terry, would you mind just sharing the presentation? Yeah, sure. See, I've got it here. Okay. Yeah. So let me do the share screen here. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen if you all could see it. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Where we are at now. Okay, um, if all of you can see my screen here, let me click on this. Okay, so, so since I can't see anybody anymore, I hope you're still, Able to uh, listen in and. Derek, can you put it in presentation mode? Oh, sure. Okay. Okay. Does this look okay? Wait. This looks like it's got the red bar. See, how does this look now then? Let's try this. Uh, perfect. Perfect. The perfect. Okay, it's a little bit odd on my screen, so I'll just do my best to speak from this. Um, so as I mentioned, that yeah, four to three different uh, fair scenarios that we um, wanted to pull in the the total operating revenues and total operating expenses, really to to show what the impacts would be to um, GRTC operations from each of these scenarios, uh, fair scenarios. And so we accumulated the total revenues and different revenue contributions um, in annual increments, and we just put these in, in five-year um, five uh, annual amounts. Uh, we pulled out the, the CVTA totals just to show you how much the CVTA uh, revenues account for, for the total revenues. We have total expenses um, that are forecast, so they do, yeah, they're a little, little bit different from you know, each other, but um, they're pretty much they're they're consistent along 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 for each uh, each of the scenarios. And ultimately, that surplus, which is that difference between the revenues and expenses, and you are seeing um, here in 2023 relatively large surpluses, and that's primarily because of the ARPA federal COVID relief funds that GRTC received, and it's up here in the top right it's about 29 million dollars that um, you know that is available for um, you know for for um, operations or 
COVID relief um, type of expenses. And so ultimately though, but you see as we move along towards the future that that uh, surplus gets spent down because of you know, additional um, expenses, filling uh, the revenue gaps, perhaps from some of these different fare scenarios. Um, and then you know, having some, some deficit by 2032, but in our, in our slides later on, we do um, identify what perhaps you know, some potential uh, uh, strategies to, to fix um, some of the gaps here. So it just gives some scale um, and these are just, you know, good uh, revenue and, and cost estimates that you see here. How come regular fare and account based are the same? And oh, because in 2022, it's not going to be there. That's what I'm hoping. Yes, it's because the, the programs don't start or they're not. Oh, that's right. It doesn't start. Okay. 2022, 23. Yes. Yeah, so we do have annual figures that may help to you know, compartmentalize the information. So that could be made available to you as well. Okay, um, th this next slide is just the, the graphic showing more annually the, the fluctuations um, in the, the surplus. And you can see when the deficits do occur, we saw um, you know, some, some slight deficits early on and then by 2032, it, you know, it comes back. So this is you know, accounting for perhaps you know, some reserves that may be needed in the future. Um, and, but you can see that each of the fair scenarios tend to um, you know, gravitate towards each other. There's nothing that deviates too much, we'll say. And again, forecasting is not a perfect science. So that's why they're probably more linear as you move along. But in the beginning here, the first two, three years, you can see the, um, the, the differences among the three scenarios with the regular fare having the, like we'll call it the highest surplus, if you will, um, and then the account base and then the zero fare. Okay, with that, um, I'm going to pass it on to, to Rick Williams, um, who did a, a peer agency review of just other um, systems um, that, that have the, the zero base fare and how they've accounted for, for their uh, revenues. So Rick, I'll, I'll still have the screen on here and just let me know when you want to Okay. The screen. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rick Williams. I'm with uh, Michael Baker and I've been working on the, um, uh, the project team. Um, you know, as part of this uh, process, you know, we looked at uh, peer transit agencies uh, who um, have also adopted uh, uh, zero fare uh, programs in recent years. And um, Derek, if you could advance the slide, please. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, we conducted uh, uh, analyses of three peer agencies that have implemented uh, zero um, fare structures. Um, and those in agencies include uh, DASH uh, in the city of Alexandria, uh, OmniRide uh, also in uh, Northern uh, Virginia, and uh, Ride KC, um, the Kansas City, Missouri area uh, transit system. And, um, you know, we do a similar uh, size to us. Kansas City is. Yeah. KC. Is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just want to kind of give it not, you know, kind of a contrast of, you know, of um, an agency that's of similar size to GRTC, uh, as well as some, you know, maybe. Um, uh, smaller agencies, but within this, uh, the, the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, advanced slide, uh, Derek. Okay. Okay. Um, what we did was, I mean, we looked at uh, their various sources of revenues, uh, passenger fares, um, other direct, uh, directly generated revenue, uh, local funds, state funding support, and also federal assistance. And um, what we found was uh, there was a heavy reliance on local funding support for these uh, zero uh, fare programs um, being derived from um, the you know municipalities uh, general fund uh, local sales taxes and even corporate sponsorships uh, as in the case of uh, ride kc uh, in, in kansas city um, they rely a lot on uh, two local sales tax measures and um, they also receive funding from a uh, federal, um, from a um, corporate sponsorship with uh, Blue Shield, uh, Blue Cross. Um, 
so you can kind of see you know the the funding um you know the breakout of the funding um you know federal assistance is also um you know a big part as well advance the slide Derek. okay and uh a second part of this uh, discussion has to do with um, how, you know, what approach that uh, GRTC can, you know, take going forward. Um, and we looked at uh, their uh, reserves, uh, operational reserves accumulated in, in part from the um, Corona Relief Funds, uh, the CARES Act, uh, ARPA, uh, CRISA, uh, state sources. Um, their uh, the uh, forecast higher than anticipated uh, DRPT DRPT operating uh, contributions, uh, you know, more regional uh, uh, contributions from uh, CBTA uh, higher than ex uh, projected revenues, um, local support um, from um, the uh, advertising program uh, that's you know being uh, implemented or may be implemented, and. Um, even a creation of reserves are set aside from the above revenue sources. Next slide. Stop there. I want to say that, um, and John, you can have more information as well. Just to dive into some of these. Uh, so, of course, we have the ARPA. They mentioned twenty-nine million. We have not uh, programmed that. We have uh, sort of earmarks we already projected to guys as far as what we would want to do. That those have to be programmed by FY twenty-four, March twenty-four. Um, just to show where our obligation is, and then spent down by 2020. So those dollars are 2029, but obligated by March 2020. Uh, the next one, you guys saw the TISDAP one, where we are um, getting higher than we originally had budgeted for. Um, and this does seem like it is sustainable, but we'll see as these other agencies jump on the zero day as well. Um, CBTA has to go through lots of approval. Uh, but of course, we are seeing uh, it come in higher than originally projected. Um, so just the conversation out there. Um, and then local support, what he's referring to is, so the post sponsorship, we were not renewed, was VOD Secours, um, VCUF. Um, so that will end at the end of June. What we're working on now is building a new advertising program for starting with that. Uh, we are doing estimates to see what our assets would be uh, for the whole sponsorship. So the platform is a lot more uh, technology that is, can also be advertised. So we're looking at a range of somewhere between maybe 750 and 1.2 for that one to start off. Um, and then we are planning on doing that in-house rather than hiring solar relatives who took 30% as a broker. Um, <clears throat> second one, as that picks up, we want to also do other, other assets for uh, advertising programs. So more wraps, um, work with the city to get shelters and groups so we can do advertising on them, just bringing on more uh, as far as what those potential revenue values would be. We'll see as we do that plan. So that's that one. And then just looking at the above, we want to set something aside and actually do a reserve and do some sort of interest on it. Um, that could also help sustain it. Great. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Next slide, please. Um, I might just kind of take it over. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so operator input and additional considerations. Can you uh, continue, Derek? Okay. Um, so they interviewed as part of our own interview, they interviewed staff as well. Uh, they interviewed about five union operators. Um, the majority of them, I think, were from 23 years experience. So we wanted more uh, versatility. So we reached back out and did an additional survey. For, it ended up being about 50 operators, and it was uh, across the board as far as what, how long we've been here. Um, but these are kind of the themes where they felt like uh, there was increase in enrollment behavior by uh, riders now, an increase in rider to rider and driver to rider in terms of relationships have now been strained, and a decrease in service performance, um, where they felt like if there was a rotation of the bus, they had to pull over, or they now have to stop more often because people are riding less, less distances. Um, and then an increase in buses use of shelter. So this is kind of the homeless population that are doing what I like call non-destination rides. Um, what this shows below is um, we did see an increase in terms of assaults, but it switched where you have, we talked about the confrontation to fare box before. So number of physical assaults has nearly tripled 
from 4 to 11, and the number of verbal assaults has declined by half. So a little bit different. This might be more of the, um, could be pandemic related, but uh, the mental health as far as what's out there uh, is right. But the number to sell percentage change after 175% physical, but negative 58%, is that what it says? What are those comparing the percents to? So the verbal, they were having discussion about fares and that, that was going back and forth, but people were physically civil, even though they weren't verbally civil. Now, they're just not even saying anything, they're just attacking people. I mean, you can probably speak more to that, but okay. I mean, that's yeah, 11, I show it. Yeah. That's, 11, that's 11 situations. And how many riders do? What's the ridership? I mean, like the hundreds of thousands, right? There's 29,000. So, I mean, that's not really that's actually not, probably. That's, not, like, it's a, that's you know, in terms of scale. I mean, that's, that is that's a, a fair point. Yeah. So, so there, is a bill, mm -hmm. there is a bill coming forward for the General Assembly to delegate a plan mm -hmm. that is going to be pointing that the 11 is a lot to further protect the operators. Oh, okay. Just moving so, what we're saying is it is a lot. Yeah, it, even especially though in the increase. Yeah. We have to. I mean, you can assume it's 11 different operators, though. So are they uh, going to make it a felony to attack a bus driver while they're working so or something? The bill, when it comes out, is going to be a mandatory minimum of 15 days after the two days of confinement and change it to a, a, a class six misdemeanor right now. So we're protecting just like other protected classes. So yes, it will be a felony. So in the timing of the increase in assaults, though, didn't a lot of that have to do with masks, mandates? Yes. Yes. A lot of that's true. Yeah. So they got mad verbally over money, but they threw fits over masks. Yes. Most of them started off as verbal, but it escalated when you come to this. Next slide, Derek. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so with that, uh, basically the, taking from the themes of the operators, um, some things to consider since we put the zero fares in place as a state of emergency without actually having the program um, to roll it out and support that the operators would like to see. So a recommendation from that is um, programs to support them, some more conflict mitigation, uh, and then connections to social services, which Joe just came from a uh, meeting just now. Yeah. So trying to get that set up, um, I mean, regardless, regardless of the program you put forward. Next slide there. Um, and some other additional considerations I just want to throw out there, though. Implementation timeline of costs. Um, we have been just throwing around numbers about nine months to 12 months to put this back in place. So there's a few, there's a few different paths to I'm talking about here, a regular fare structure would take 10 to 14 months to put back. So we are looking at at least continuing zero fares um, until something can be put in. And the capital cost for that is about $700,000. Account-based system, a lot more complicated. Um, and that one we're saying about 15 to up to two years to implement that. And what about a $1.5 million investment in capital? Um, even what we're doing now with zero fares, technically we're out of compliance with city code. Um, so there's, we're, but we're, we're working on updating that, a few other things um, related to that. So that would also have to be updated because um, our fares are all listed in there. And then I just threw in there as I became knowledgeable that um, Wamada, Blacksburg, and then I just mentioned either BCU or UVA or Charlottesville is also added to the list. Um, the Virginia ones are relevant because I mean, their ridership will increase, which could potentially change that to set and then it does happen potentially. Um, I think that's the last slide for the rest. Yeah. I think the last one's just just searching. So if you guys want to hone in on any specific parts or any questions, you can definitely elaborate. So when you did the fares, regular fares or the account based. You incorporated the increased cost for personnel and all of that into the expenses when you were showing the differentials. It should include that. Correct, Derek. I don't have the capital cost listed here. 
But we're so they were included. Them. Yeah, they were page included one. in the forecast. Page one. Can you go back to that chart that showed the three choices in the I think every page. five years? That's that's the chart. I'm sure. 22, 27, 13. We'll go back to that slide. Okay. The right one. No, maybe that's not it. That doesn't show the breakdown. Yeah, okay. that's there's the, cost the, the actual cost is in there, but it's not like. It doesn't see the account based at the bottom. Like, at least there aren't. I guess my question is you know, you're saying zero fare uh, 10 years from now, uh, showing a deficit of 1.8, it has to be overcome. And if you collect fares, you have a deficit of 1.8. And that, that must show that the cost of collective fares is relatively equivalent to the fares you collect. I mean, that's it isn't though. It's there's a five million dollar gap, right? So is that considering the qualification of ridership? Because ridership dips that you qualify less for less grants. Like, how is it if you collect fares or if you don't collect fares? How is the surplus the same? Like it's it's eighty million in twenty seven. If you don't collect fares, it's eighty one million. If you do. Is it because of the TIS Act? Is that is that's the TISDAC change in the revenue contributions yeah, in it's only these three scenarios? It's only a million dollars to net revenue if you collect fares. Derek, can you explain why they are the same? Yeah, if I can maybe explain a bit here. Um, we're focusing on the 2032 column here, the last one, that the zero fare embedded in the revenue assumptions here or the total amount is that. Um, that that continuation of partnership revenues or that assumption of that five point five million dollars, um, you know, that will have to come from from somewhere to to, to continue the zero fare program. The regular fare, then, you know, yeah, is that result of um, you know of, of whatever fare is collected um, from mm -hmm. you know from this program. So it just comes. Yeah, that just made just. Yeah. 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 Just with our forecast. But, but just assuming we fill the gap, it's yeah. actually 85. But is this like where does the the effect of the TISDAC funding based on ridership in this? I don't doesn't I mean the numbers aren't fluctuating enough to suggest that there's that that's being taken into account in this analysis. As far as additional increase from where we are today. Well, what we're Where saying is zero fare should have higher ridership, so we should get a higher reimbursement than if we have regular fare, and he doesn't see that thing. No, because we're already at our max. We have to, you only can go to 30% of that. I think the key is there in 2027, 81 million, no fare, 81.8 fare. The assumption is that in the 80.9 is that local jurisdictions, local match will assumed to cover the 5.5 million whereas i think and is that the right number well it should come out here i'm not like i don't know like i feel like this is we either need to see the component pieces that are going up and up and down um to to draw rope because first of all we've got um again so you, you said right at a cap on this but like if ridership were to go down considerably because of fair implementation, then we would need to see revenue from TISDAC go down Correct. as well. Like, and just be blunt, I don't see that that, without really looking into- He's saying regular fare should have a decrease in revenue from TISDAC. Yes, he's not so seeing. you would add 5 million in, or seven, 5 million net in revenues from fares, but you might see yeah, a dip in TISDAC. 5 million in TISDAC go down. So we just need to know what that balance is. And that 5 million should come out of zero fares revenue because it assumes that we'll just make up the gap. Yeah. It I shouldn't agree. be in there. Yeah, that, that's not the assumption, right? Like that's like- No, yeah, it's just assume that. Yeah. Well, yeah, because we don't know how to make a decision based on if, if all that's assumed. I mean, right now you look at the board and you go, well, Zero fares a no-brainer, but without the pieces that go in it, you can't make that assumption. I'd like to give you a version of the spreadsheet that takes out CVTA, shows what goes to the capital, what goes towards maintenance and service, takes out ARPA, and also um, shows the outright. 
Yeah, we guys look at it in more detail. I don't want to. Let John and I will. He has that. We'll review it one more time before we send it back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you can see. It's kind of hard to go as much into more in the weeds without passing level. Agreed. Would be okay. In the assumptions, they kept it. They the it looks like the state, the, state, the, state, the state operating is the same for all three scenarios. Yeah, I think let's dive that with that with more of that. I can see two reasons. I mean, reasons for it. We are at our max, but we are not at our max because of zero fares. We are at our max from Fairbox from 2019. So they haven't even reinstated the TISDAP with the zero fares. Yeah, yeah, so it's based on fares. So you could make that assumption unless you're assuming ridership is decreasing with fares coming back because our ridership is different. But I think you could assume that unless others put in zero fare and we don't, then 30%, that's what 30% would go back with. Right. That's, that's, that's <clears throat> and then it doesn't really show us what the gap is. It does not. That um, the localities would have to make up when we're looking at that. It's just assuming that we will. So that, but we need to know what that looks like so we can have a discussion about how that gets made up. Um, I mean, can you go back to the one that shows the fair revenue? And just do that. That's like a slide before this. So, is there another one? See that. <clears throat> You want to see? Uh, uh, keep, keep going up. You're going up? Okay. So, okay. Keep going, keep going. I think it's on 18. Page 18. Is it slide 18? See if that's it. This is the peer agency one. Yeah, we don't have any of the GRTC information here. Uh, it's slide 18. Uh, Try 18. Oh, 18. Okay. Yeah. Oh, here's the numbers down here. All right. Okay. I mean, this doesn't show that exactly, but kind of shows what the revenue would be for each of those sources. Assuming right now we have a five and a half billion dollar gap in FY23 to fill that hole, you can assume that depending on ridership projections could change, but I mean, as far as just a reaction, account based fares is going to have a hole, regular fares um, <clears throat> it have, it's going to have a little bit of a hole, and of course, we have that five and a half across the board. For I mean, if this is appropriate, Adrian, and if just you know this helps with the discussion, you know, I'd be happy to show the, the the spreadsheet if if all of you would like to see it and use that as a basis for your discussion, which has the breakdown of the revenues, the annual amounts, and you know if we're at that point, if you'd like to discuss that. I, think, I don't know if it would be helpful because the spreadsheet does not break down um, what would be the actual delta, assuming no additional revenue sources allocated specifically to subsidize the zero fares. Okay. Okay. I think they need to see that to see what the real hole is. Yeah, so we're gonna need somebody to do that and then send it to us so that we can evaluate that. Because I, I don't think we have enough information yet. That won't take and, much and we need to see if we think there's a change in ridership drop based on collecting regular fares and what that might do to um state funding. State funding. So I, I just am not understanding the quote unquote we're at our cap when we also I guess this is my understanding is we saw to revenues go up seven million this year. So did the cap move? Did what would those two things don't seem to line up in my head? We're at the cap now, but we the cap the will cap, cap could change from forward, correct? Right? Any of it could change. They could change the yeah. physical formula again. Yeah. They could change the cap. They could we mean, qualify at a different level. Yeah, we, we, we still so make a ten-year assumption level. based on what we think is possible. So I think it just hit the FY19 as what they were using. Yeah. So it's always delayed. So we that was our highest ridership at that time. Mm -hmm. So if they're using that, that would have given us the increase over previous years. So in FY19, we were 8.6 opposed to seven something the year before. So that year actually finally got hit. And so we got money for the second. Yeah, so that stays for three years until they do the next year. Mm -hmm. right. The formula stays for three years. Every three years, they redo it. Right. What's the, um, <clears throat> we need to make a decision on this by when? 
Well, nine I, months to implement. Nine yeah. months to implement. I, I, would, I mean, I, we're probably at 10 months to a year. I, I would agree to cut to the chase. Go back to the 23 chart. There's money there. I don't think I mean, we can talk about this, talk about it. We need more data. They're giving us data. We want more data. But I think it's safe for this group to understand that I'm pretty confident that we can see that we have the ability to, to extend for a year. I don't think we should make a public announcement of any kind that we're making a decision to move. I think it's very safe for this group to recommend to the general board that we have the fiscal capacity to extend it for a year while we continue to evaluate. I don't have a problem with that. My, the only concern I have is if we think that there's going to be a hole in the out years and we we got to figure out how we're going to fill that hole because the longer we wait, if we decided we had to go back to fares, I think the harder it's going to, I think the more impact we're going to have on ridership if we re-implement fares. So, so I mentioned That's that, my only concern. Yeah. So I mentioned that this is expansion neutral and it's based on your operating costs as you expand your operating is also going to expand mm -hmm. so therefore you would actually bring in more money as that expands as well so if it right was right if it was there were fares but fare free we're not bringing in more money unless it is the no no it's we're talking about here it's 30 percent based on your current amount so you're going to put in more than a million dollars more in for expansion that increases your amount for in terms of the 30 percent, which is money you can Okay, well that's what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that was your that was your yeah. so again to Mr. Nelson's point, I concur with them 100 percent I think it's very safe for this group to continue to study it, but I certainly recommend that the this group's recommendation to the board is proceed as planned with fiscal year 24. I guess that's the budget coming yeah. up. So, so is as, that is that recommendation because of, I think if you look at the board packet that went out. We got more, and we got more zero fare. We're going to keep getting hit with the zero fare public public comments until we say it's we're going to keep it for you know what I'm saying. Wait, we're we're going to keep it for a year. We're going to keep it to extend it because if not, it's it's working. Our ridership yeah. is back. It's up. We're recovering faster than the than the national average. We think we our, our families and residents in our regional jurisdictions still need the support, and we think it's in our best interest to continue for another year. Yeah, I think RVA rapid transit is concerned, and so they really like drumming up the zero fare. Like they had a whole, um, they had a whole. It was almost like a whole page in the free press article. They spent a lot of money on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. helping promote. I was flipping the pages. I was like, what? <laughs> so, so your point is to make a statement that we are continuing it. For at least a year, I well, think, you know, we're still in the best interest of our residents. It can just come up in the. It can just come up. Don't, don't we have um? Is is the finance committee? The finance committee is on the agenda. So yeah. are you give yeah. a report. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can, yeah, yeah, you can give a report. Yeah. And then the second, we were thinking about because the second half was like a session to talk about collective bargaining, which would be another assumption into the drafting point for budget. So we, I'm assuming we're going to have another January finance committee meeting. So part of the output, you know, could be you know, to crystallize the set, you know, objectives or objectives in the budget. Yes. So, so one of the recommendations out of this committee and the board and your notes will be. Full recommendation for one extended one full year to extend for at least one full year for what you said yeah, for the in considerate in assumption and consideration of our fiscal 24 budget and not that yeah. it makes yeah. sense for this organization in our yeah. room. we would ask the director yeah. to present the budget based off or develop the budget based off of that yeah. Yeah. and not that it won't be considered for another year after that but we're just taking it one day at a time that's all we can do i'm hearing that they are are there bus are there signs on the bus that says zero fare is going to be in place in 2025. So there's PS, there's PS, there was a PSA on the bus. Somebody check into that one. Yeah, because I, I was told that we have, that is in writing that we said we were going to get to its 2025. That is because of the DRPD grant that the city did. Do we do it with DRTC? We did. Was well, that the 8630? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that. So that means that we, that's what we told the people. Right? Theory of the application to true. To say that we would do it. Well, I think this that. is this goes to the point. Is like I think to Dan's point, like we we clearly have the revenues to continue with through twenty five. Um, and I understand, you know, we, we the city we're we're in partnership with GRCC on that, but we have the revenues to do it. 
um, there's no reason to say that we're, we're really considering pulling out before the end of the grant period, and, and but we have not made a permanent long-term solution. To Jim's point, yes, we need, we need to sooner than later communicate whether riders should expect this after the grant period. But I don't see us pulling out while we're still getting DRPT money to, to cost share of this. I don't know if we'll ever say we're committing to it forever. We're running yeah, an organization, we, you know, and I think a year or two planning, we're good, we're mm -hmm. in great shape, we're making the best decisions for this organization and our residents and our region. Mm -hmm. And we'll continue to take on the burden of evaluation yeah. every year. Do we want to have a, with the implementation of a decision to change anything? Just for our purposes, when would we have to have a decision by that date by? They say nine to 12 months. So if yeah. that's when that would be by September. September, November, we I talked mean, about I just feel like mm -hmm. having that expectation for analysis also shares why we are committing to it. When we do want to fix this, explore this in the future, and this is what we will be yeah. discussing, because I think that helps not let all the lobbying yeah. happen get around. It's kind of yeah. like, this is when we're focusing on it. Leave us alone another 10 months. Sure. <laughs> okay. And the two so sisters that puzzle are in place now. Yeah. This is the second ever meeting right. of a finance committee of this organization in Hemlock. Right. We yeah. formed these committees to do just that. Right. To do so. Do, do we have do we have finance committee on the agenda or is it still finance, the financial report? No, the actual committee is on the agenda towards the end. Okay. So then that's you because you're the chair right now. Oh, you're the chair. So then I think you just need to kind of tee it up. Well, I have a, I have a type of yeah, yeah, recommendation yeah. from the yeah. Okay. Now, are we going to um, go into this today, or is this? We are when you're ready to move on. Okay. Yeah, let's read, read the. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Derek, yes, thank for the you. presentation, Derek. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, folks, okay. I move. Right thank you. I move the GRTC's Board of Directors Finance Committee uh, hold a closed meeting pursuant to section 2.2-3711A1 of the Code of Virginia for the discussion and consideration of a personnel matter of the Greater Richmond Transit Company. We have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We don't have
Whereas the Board of Directors Finance Committee of GRTC is convened in a closed meeting on this date pursuant to affirmative action recorded vote in accordance with provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. And whereas section 2.23712 of the Code of Virginia requires certification by the board and committee that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now therefore be it resolved that this board slash committee hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public matters lawfully exempt from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certifying resolution applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, and or considered by the board. Witness the following vote of the board members, Mr. Engel. Aye. Mr. Addison. Aye. Mr. Saunders. Aye. Mr. Nelson. Aye. Mr. Schmidt. Aye. Thank you. Any Mr. other business? Need a motion to adjourn to January 12th? Yeah, turn these back. We need a motion to adjourn, Mr. Jones. So moved. Second.